about these days. So, you know, it's a big day today because uh, it's always a big day these days in the world of the economy. We had the census data out, and for us, that's like Christmas. Uh, a lot of our long-term projections are based on demographics. So I haven't had a chance to go through them. I got Globe had a story on it yesterday. I had a interesting to see just the migration patterns. It looks like you're getting a shift underway where traditionally the GTAs had about you know 40 percent of the new international migrants. That share is in decline as more people head westward, um, and, and that'll have implications. I think it feeds into some of the views that the economy isn't going to grow as rapidly in the future. So. You know, it's adjusting to that new paradigm. So I'll speak a bit, and I'm not all pessimist. I mean, there are reasons to be, to think we will, we will see some growth. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in terms of Europe, I think uh, that's obviously a key thing. Um, but I, I often like to start off just with a bit of a context setting. Well, that, that's sort of the very high level. We do expect some growth, and uh, I'll tell you why. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on it again. I think we often get caught up as analysts. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, and when you, you know, you're looking at Europe, and many different things could play out there. It's very hard to pin down. It's more more optimism. We're not headed for a disaster, but there still is a risk. So that's all downside stuff. But there are a lot of upside risks. So the United States has been pleasantly surprising us. So I, I think it's important to point out that any good forecast should be balanced. It's not. So it really depends on how I want to tell the story. Now I can focus on the downside risk. But I'll give you a bit of both. Keep it balanced and. Uh, just a little bit on, on, the, on the housing prices. That, that view may be a little bit dated. I, I don't think we're quite as, oh no, that, that's all right. We, we had in, a, in the, one of the headings, I think it says in 2012, we're gonna see a bit of a price correction, but we're not believing that uh, anymore. Cool. Now lately what's helped reduce the amount of worries because Greece we know is still facing enormous challenges and this is an important week for Greece. Uh, but the European Central Bank has provided a lot of liquidity to the banks, three year, uh, issues. The banks have been lapping it up. It's the way they've been keeping their funding going. And I know there are a lot of financial people that can uh, that, that follow that because uh, it does get a bit complex. But the banks need funding and they haven't been able to get it so uh, directly from the markets. But the European Central Bank has been helping them. So that's the liquidity risk. But we're still dealing with the, the solvency risk of Greece. And the next few weeks are going to be very important because they need new funding from the so-called Troika that have been supporting them in the European Union, IMF, European Central Bank. And if they don't get it by March the 20th, that's when the next big bond issue comes up. That's when they could default. That's when they could leave the European, uh, the Eurozone, go to the back to their currency. And the worry is that if they do that, it just it gets messy and nobody knows how, what impact would happen in the markets. So the hope is they won't. And, and so we're watching. A key element here, and I'm gonna move on in a second, I promise. The key element here is for the, the, a lot of the banks that hold on to the debt, they're the private bondholders of Greece, that they agree to take a big haircut on their holdings. And it's not easy. There are a lot of different parties involved, and, uh, and, and they're still negotiating. So the hope is that they reach an agreement. They'll mark down their holdings, and uh, it won't lead to contagion risks. It shouldn't anyway. So anyway, the problem is this could be something we'll go through every three months, because then there'll be the next issue. You know? So uh, anyway, it is the wild card, but all I can tell you is our underlying assumption here now, that you're not going to get massive systemic type risks, the kind of 08, 09 type financial risks that obviously even affected Canada. But it's still going to be a bumpy ride and we're going to have bouts of, of nervousness out there. So that's kind of our underlying. So there you go. Um, it's, I told you there was a lot to cover. Um, it's, it, I was saying before, it's true. I mean, we always like to speak out of both sides of our mouth, you both hands, and you've got, for every positive thing, there's an area of concern. You know, I say the U.S., well, you know, they're doing better, but yet they still have all these challenges. Um, housing, uh, that employment spurt we've had could slow down. And in Europe, there's a huge uncertainty. The flip side, they could, you know, they could do better, we could do better, we could see more consumer spending with low rates. Um, so a lot of risks around this equation, but I'm happy with kind of sitting somewhere in the middle ground of kind of slow growth. I do not see any kind of boom prospects uh, uh, on the horizon, partly domestically, the consumer fatigue, and, that, and the government is a huge part of that. Uh, and that gives you sort of a sense on the, uh, the housing, and uh, lastly, the risks. And, and I, I tend to worry more about the downside, obviously. We, we spent a lot of time within the bank doing stress testing. It's the regulation requires that we look at these nasty scenarios 
what if, is a bank going to be able to weather the storm? The good news is the banks are strong and, and the TD is strong. So, uh, you know, we fare well under the test, but still, you, you tend to get into all these negative scenarios and it really gets you, so you have to pull yourself back a little bit. But, you know, the Europe is certainly still the big focus and we'll see how that plays out. The next week or so, follow the news because that should be very informative. Uh, you know, will Greece be given that next tranche of funding so they can meet the bond, uh, the, the big uh, maturity is March the 20th, they've got a lot of debt coming due for renewal. So the question is, does the IMF and the, the, they call them the Troika, the three of them, provide the funding uh, you know, through the ESFS and uh, their, their big European stability fund, or do they not? Because they don't meet the criteria, they got to implement structural reforms. And that's still, we still want, we th I think they will, I think they'll find a way to reach a deal, but my goodness, it's taking a long time and the protests in Greece are just massive. So it's certainly not inconceivable that they could just say, they could just say, look, we're leaving and uh, we're going to go back to the drachma. And what happens after that is your guess is as good as mine. You'd think we've been talking about it long enough that hopefully the outcome wouldn't be as bad as some have feared, but it's very difficult to map through all the, uh, I don't have a good enough model for that. So anyway, that is uh, kind of the story. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, uh, and if not, we can leave early. <laughs>